and welcome to this very exciting lunchtime RTS session on why we love property shows. Um, it's going to, for the last two decades, shows about homes have been a constant staple of both our daytime and prime time, attracting huge audiences across the schedule. And we can watch people buy homes, sell homes, build homes, improve homes, move to the country, move to the sea, move to rural France, wherever you want. The list goes on, but our appetite has not waned. Location, Location, Location is now in its 34th series, amazingly. And it's still attracting big audiences with the latest series seeing the highest audiences in recent years. DIY SOS has had 30 series and counting and has gone from strength to strength and was the UK's number one property makeover show last year. And the recent run of Your Home Made Perfect, the latest addition to the property party, has been a big hit with young viewers. With our esteemed panel, I'm going to be discussing why we love these shows, what makes a great property show, and where the format might be headed in the world of Netflix, Amazon Prime, Instagram, and Gen Generation Z, Z, being perfectly priced out of even the dream of owning their own property. Let's introduce the panel. Well, yes, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, we've got Kirsty Allsop, TV presenter, property expert, legend, whose property show credits, of course, include Location, 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 Love It or List It, many others, and of course, now the whole world of craft shows. Welcome, Kirsty. Hello, Boyd. Hello, everyone else. We've got Damien Burrows, architect, director of DMBA Architects and presenter, whose property show credits include Grand Designs, House of the Year, and Your Home Made Perfect. Welcome, Damien. Afternoon, guys. Thank you. The legendary Nick Knowles, TV presenter, producer, writer, whose show credits, of course, include DIY SOS, Wild About Your Garden, and Home is Where the Art Is. Welcome, Nick. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you. Kitty Walsh, co-managing director of Remarkable Television, whose property production credits include Your Home Made Perfect on BBC Two, The House That 100K Built, also on BBC Two, and Channel 4's Restoration Home. Hi, Kitty. Hello. And we've got uh, from Channel 4, Deborah Dunnett, commissioning editor for Popular Factual. Deborah has worked on or developed a long list of property shows over the last decade, including Location, 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 Love It or List It, Phil Spencer, Secret Agent, and Kirsty's Best of Both Worlds. Welcome, Deborah. Hey, everyone. Now, um, Kirsty, let's start with you. I, I feel like I've been doing my job at Heat Magazine for 21 years, and you've yeah. been doing pretty much location, location, location for about as long. Well, how come your show and how come property shows in general have been so enduring? I think it's about the human stories. Certainly in the case of Location Location, it's a home show rather than a property show. We're finding someone a home. And we all invest so much about how our relationships are going to work, how our jobs are going to work, how our everything is going to work on, on the basis of where we live and how we live. Um, and we use our homes to say something about ourselves. Um, so I think it's that fascination with people's stories. There's an intrinsic nosiness um, that we all have. And when you, you look into people's relationships at the same time as looking into their home. Nick, you're, you've specialised in kind of makeover shows as well, but is there a particular reason why you think your show has also endured 20, 21 years? Um, well, it's gone through well, to pick up on what on what you uh, on what you said earlier, that the, um, makeover shows the first of them was of any real note was a guy called Barry Bucknell who did it in the late fifties, called Do It Yourself, and got seven and a half million viewers a show in those days. So as look, you know, pretty much as long as television's been around, there's been makeover shows, and people are wanting to know. Um, in fact, he was responsible for saving a lot of architectural pieces like fireplaces and really interesting doors because he came up with a Hollywood look where you could buy hardboard and tack them on your doors and over your fireplaces to get that flat fronted look, the cheap way to get that flat fronted look, which actually saved a lot of um, old uh, architectural things that we've all sort of re uncovered again in the last few years. But I think it's just part of the human condition that you want to, uh, you want to prettify, you want to uh, make the space that you live in um, a, a nicer place to be. I think over the last 20 years, probably, we've become all a little bit obsessed with um, improving the value of our home because our home has become a commodity more than it ever was in the last couple of thousand years. Um, 
So that's been a slight change. But I think with the lockdown, I think that's changed a bit as well. But we've always been interested. I mean, you know, right from early cave paintings, people were doing things on their walls to make the place look a little bit more homely, a little bit more interesting. So I think it must be part of the human condition to want to change things. Deborah, are you surprised at all by just how um, long these shows have been going on and how long they've been a staple, particularly of Channel 4 schedules, Kirsty's shows particularly, and they're still going strong, stronger than ever. I mean, it is quite extraordinary, isn't it? I think it is, but I, but I think as well that there's an element of familiarity that people crave. I think particularly at the moment, the numbers that we're seeing for location, location at the moment, um, to me, it's about, um, I think a property format represents a sort of something that you, you know what it is and you can ease into it. Um, and so it's that sort of, it's that part of escapism where you can just have a cup of tea and know what you're going to get fed, if you like. Um, but with, for, for some reason, because I guess because there's so many different kinds of relationship or family or property out there, it never starts to feel uh, not fresh. You know, there, there's, we're lucky in Britain, we have so many different kinds of property to explore, but it's never, as Kirsty said, it's not just about being a property, it's about being a home, and therefore it's about people more sometimes than it is about property. And I think that's what keeps it fresh and means that every new episode doesn't just feel derivative or something that you've seen before. Hmm. Damien, are you surprised that, you know, shows like Grand Designs um, and Your Home Made Perfect, they've kind of popularised architecture, haven't they, to some extent? And everyone seems to be interested in it now. Everyone seems to be still obsessed with, with this type of show. Is that a surprise to you? And why do you think, do you have anything to add as to why you think it's such a, such a staple of our schedules? I think it is just, it's just a great British love affair that will never, ever cease, I think. Um, I think in the UK as well, especially, and probably in Australia and the States, people are more used to living in their own home, as opposed to the rest of Europe, where people tend to live in apartment blocks, where there's less scope for doing more improvement. So there's something that's just in our psyche about that, you know, the English man in your castle, having your little home. And because there's such a rich texture of architectural styles to choose from in the UK, there's always something that people want to latch onto. Usually it's period properties. I think now it's actually going back to sort of mid-century properties, mid-20th century properties with great big windows and there's a, a love of modernism that's coming back. But I think when you put all of those things together, it just means that there's so much to choose from and it's just something that's ingrained in us that we, we love homes. Absolutely. Um, I should mention, by the way, to everyone watching, that if you want to add, uh, ask your own question to the panel, please use the Q&A function, and um, I'll get to those questions later. Uh, I'll try and make sure we'll leave enough time. Kitty, um, in terms of, of, of uh, property shows, um, and what are the ingredients, do you think, of making a really classic property format, a format that's going to endure for years and years and years, like the ones we've talked about have? Um... For me, I suppose the first thing is being useful. <laughs> you know, I, I think you've got to be a really useful um, show to viewers at home. Um, I think when you think of the panel we've got here and you think of all the shows that everyone makes, that's probably a key ingredient. And, you know, even with DIY SOS, which may not feel useful on the nose, but actually there's a lot of takeout in that show you know you learn a lot of things and you learn about what you might be able to do in your own home so for me you know being um useful as well as being quite entertaining you know having great um spirits in there uh, personality uh, those feel like the really key components for me i think in what makes these shows successful being good company to watch mm. Nick, do you think the, the formats that you've worked on that have, gone, that, that have endured so long, do you, have you ever felt tempted to, to do a complete, you know, more refreshes on them? Or do you think they actually endure because the formats are simple and incredibly compelling and you're meeting real people, new real people every week? No, I think you've got to, you've got to evolve your project. If you look at the start of uh, DIY SOS, it looks nothing at all like the programme that it is today. And that's not by accident, because each at the end of every series, me and the producers would sit down and say, OK, how are we going to evolve it this time round? It's got to evolve each series 
a little bit each series. If you look at something like Changing Rooms, which was on for a long time, but never really changed, it kind of got to a point where it couldn't sustain any longer because people kind of knew those hit points. Having said that, there are much loved series like Grand Designs, which are, you know, you can pick your moment when they're going to say, um, I was surprised they decided to project manage it themselves. And there's another point where they go, and how much over budget are you? So yeah, there, are key, there are hit points that you know all the way through, but actually they've got to such a point now that we kind of love those moments and we're kind of waiting to find exactly how much over budget they are uh, in the same way as we're quite pleased when we um, watch something like um, Antiques Roadshow and somebody finds out that their thing they thought was worth thousands is actually only worth about 30 quid. That's quite good fun too. So there are, there are different things. With our show in particular, um, Ours is kind of, the building side of it is almost uh, secondary to the, the, the other stuff that goes on. In the way that, say, for example, uh, Top Gear is normally about cars, but really it's about the relationship of the three people involved. That's what really made it a big seller. And they, that's why they couldn't get it to work for a long time. It's only just started to work again because they've got those relationships right again. With DOSOS, it's very much a sort of builder's soap that happens to be in a building arena. And then, of course, you've got those amazing stories of people there with Kirsty. Kirsty and Phil's relationship is, you know, is one of the great television relationships. And I think presenters who think that the show is about them, one person, uh, end up sort of going in and out of fashion fairly quickly. But if you can actually create relationships on screen that people um, see as real, uh, then I think then you have an enduring format. And then you can load it with the things like, uh, you know, interesting tips or advice or um, ways to go about doing what you do. Um, but realistically, at, at the centre of it, there has to be a relationship with uh, with the people that 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 people can engage with. Otherwise, television doesn't on, on any subject doesn't work. Kirsty, do you agree with that, that, that? That your relationship with Phil has been the key to location, location. Of course, you've both done different projects, and you keep coming back to to this one, don't you? Um. Someone once said about Phil and I that we're very different personalities and very similar characters. I'm really, really genuinely fond of Phil. I, mean, I was on the telephone to Phil uh, yesterday. We've got a Zoom meeting after this. We talk about everything. We, you know, we are a, a unit. And then we did, we, with three colleagues, set up our own production company. And so... I get that. I do find it strange. I mean, people tell it to me all the time that it's about Phil and I's relationship. And I've kind of acknowledged that that's true. But I think that it's good. What Nick said when he said, um, don't think it's about you. Equally, it's really important that Phil and I don't think it's about our relationship and us. And if we become too obsessed with that, it would wreck everything. It, it has to be about your relationship with those people. Catelyn Moran wrote a piece once about location, location, in which she said it was the midwifery of the property world. Um, and it, it, was a, it was a brilliantly uh, uh, um, written piece, and it made the comparison between midwifery and what Phil and I do in, in easing oh. those facts and desires out of people and, in, and persuading them that we can find them what they want. And I think that is so important. It's about the relationship, yes, between Phil and I, but also between us, the house hunters, and the houses. Yep. Damien, Damien have you, do you watch the shows yourself? Do you consume other property shows that you're not directly involved with? Do you have an appreciation of the fact that, do you agree that these relationships are key and that the presenters are, are very important as well as the formats? Yeah, completely. I mean, <clears throat> you look at the relationship that Kirsty and Phil have got, and it shines through on the screen, and it's, it's lovely to watch. And also the relationship with the presenters and the people that they're covering, the contributors. I mean, that is golden as well, because it's really, it's really difficult sometimes to get that emotion out of the people that you're interviewing and to get them to tell you their story. And also to get them to feel really comfortable on screen, because that's when you get the most out of them. That's when the viewers get the most out of them as well. I mean, for me personally, I like uh, the sort of property programs that sort of push the architectural envelope a little, which is always great, because I've always been a sort of long held the view that sometimes architects can be their own worst enemy. 
in terms of trying to get across to people what it is that we do and how we can make their homes much better and just to be able to engage with them and drop that defense that people often think, oh, I, architects aren't for me. I, I couldn't use an architect on my home. That's just if you've got loads of money. So the sort of programs that do that successful, I think are ones like 100K House, because that's dealing with a really great subject on a tight budget. And then explaining some of the more complex projects like Extraordinary Arms of the World, and being able to take all of that information and break it down into these little bite-sized chunks that people can digest and get interested in. Those are the sort of property programs that I really find quite exciting. Can I just say on that subject as well, I think you're absolutely right about architecture and I think people have become much more in, engaged with architecture. Um, when, when we had to build, uh, we got the opportunity to build for the families and the community at Grenfell. We were given a space up under the uh, M40, the, under the Westway, that was essentially a large cube and the most space that you could, to make the most of that space, the building that you should build to make the most of that space and give them the most space to work in, to have a gym and a community centre and counselling rooms and so on and so forth would have been a cube. But it was more important to us that we, would, we demonstrated to the people in that area that there was enough love in the country that what we were going to give them was more important than just, um, just, uh, just usable space. It had to show the care and attention. So the architectural building that we built with a, with a walkway between where a community could get together wasn't the optimum use of space, but it showed an enormous amount of care and love. And why shouldn't they have something beautiful rather than just um, effective? And that we take to every situation we, we go. One of the difficulties with disability um, uh, equipment when we build it into people's houses is that it looks like hospitals and people have spent enough time in hospitals. They don't want stuff to look like hospitals. So we take enormous trouble to try and build rooms and equipment and recolor equipment to make sure that it doesn't look medical and architecture is really really important in that and it, to the extent that the program we although we put buildings up very quickly when we put up for a, a, a children's charity about four four years ago a place called little miracles in peterborough uh won the second highest came second in the highest architectural awards uh, in the country that year because it functional is not enough yeah. you know and 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 because you have disability or because you have difficulty in life, uh, because you've been grown up, uh, you, you, you're living in a wheelchair and you don't necessarily have room, it doesn't mean that you're any less, uh, uh, you want any less something beautiful. Lawrence, for example, Lawrence Lone Bone, who works with us as a designer, one of the lovely things about him coming to work with us has been that we were able to show part of him that hasn't been shown before. He lost his father very young, his mother was disabled, and he grew up making beautiful things to to cheer up her room and make her home more beautiful, which is why his designs are so spectacular. But once you can take that into the environment we take it into, it gives it another level. So I absolutely agree with you that architectural care and beauty is of enormous importance, not just functionality. No, it completely is. And having the opportunity for architects within that sort of setup, it just shows that architecture isn't just this sort of great big modernist cube that's cantilevered out of a hillside. It's right down to the little intimate things that you touch, the door handles, the frames, the materials, the colors, how spaces work together. And that's the brilliant thing about the property programs now is that they're really putting that out for people to see and they're starting to absorb it. And the more that the public and architecture come together, that's why we're gonna get amazing spaces all together. I think it's very interesting what you're both saying. Sorry, Sorry go on, yeah. No, go on. No. I've, I just find it very frustrating when I go and see some of the modern properties, the family homes that are being built today, how they don't work, they don't function, there isn't a, a, an appreciation of all the things that you've both been saying. And I, I, I find that there is a, a divide between those homes, which I do occasionally see, which make your heart sing, um, and those that, you, that make your heart sink. Sorry, Boyd, I interrupted you. No, I think that's really interesting. What I was going to say, ask Deborah and Kitty about was what, what you're all saying about property shows is there a thing interest useful reminder of that that um, it's not just about huge aspiration, that you know, really important issues can be are covered in these shows often, Deborah. Don't you think because one complaint I think that a lot of probably people might level at 
property shows now is that buying property feels so out of reach for young people in particular. So do you feel like actually property shows do have to show that usefulness is, is really, really key now? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I, Kirsty, I think would, would hopefully agree with me here, which is the property market is not one property market. It is a different property market every place you go across the UK. And actually in a lot of places, young people can buy. And, 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 you know, some of the stats that get, you know, talked about in terms of how pricey properties are can be very sort of London or, you know, specific sort of triangle specific around schools. It is very frustrating when I read stuff in the press about properties. It, it is so uh, South, Southern centric and but I know how difficult it is because, you know, I uh, work with two Glasgow based production, you know, all of our productions have always come out of Glasgow. And I know that the teams in Glasgow of those young people in those offices, far more of them own their own properties than you would ever find. And, you know, Glasgow is an expensive city um, in London or in the South, you know, Bristol, um, you know, even now, you know, Channel 4 have got a hub in Leeds. I think you would find that the more of the young people in the office in Leeds would own their own home than you would at a Horse Ferry Road. I mean, there's no doubt we've always had trouble, you know, so many people pitch formats for um, people who don't own. Um, and it is, it's problematic because, you know, it's very hard to authentically transform a space that uh, that gets passed on to somebody else six months later and to really go on that journey with people but you know there's things that bbc3 do really well which is sort of just attacking you know whether it's the, the um, cleaning or um figuring out a person by delving into their underwear drawer or whatever you can there are still ways and means to do it but the last um series of location 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 did incredibly well for young so it had its highest share since 2011 so i think one thing we haven't talked about so far is actually people's engagement with the subject, the people on screen, whether they engage with each other or, but I think as long as somebody, clever people talking about clever things or passionate people doing the thing that they're passionate about, whether it's plastering a wall for somebody whose story they've heard and really want uh, to be a part of, or whether it's world's most extraordinary homes and just visiting them and talking about why they work. I think there's room for everything in there. And equally to your point about economics, you know, I always think homes under the hammer is a bit disappointing if they look like they've got lots of money. You know, you want to feel that they're clawing their way through the property market and, and you get on board with that. So I sort of, I like to think that with property, because of what we've talked about, the, the amount of families there are, or the, the variation and diversity of house and um, contributor means that there's room for all of it. Kitty, do you agree with that? Do you think that, are, are we too obsessed? Are, 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 you know, a lot probably, as Kirsty says, a lot of uh, critics and journalists too obsessed with the London property market. And in fact, we, have, we should think more nationally. And does that affect the way you put your formats together? Well, I think it's worth remembering that 63% of households in England are still uh, homeowners. You know, so that that that's a really useful stat to kind of remember. What certainly it was at the forefront of my mind when we were thinking about your home made perfect, because we were trying to think about the next generation of property show and thinking, do we? How relevant are we? If we think about, uh, you know, makeover where you've got to be a homeowner, and that stat I think is quite useful to then have in your mind and think actually we are being broad because you're still trying to make a show that appeals to 63%. And, and I think a lot of people, you know, renting now, they look at it for different reasons. You can still get ideas and aspirations and there's still a desire to want to get on that property ladder at, at some stage. And I think, you know, the, the bigger sort of turn of the wheel is something that was mentioned earlier about perhaps it's less about trying to make money now from your property and actually find a home that you want to live in and live in long term and I think maybe the whole kind of you know wanting to buy and sell uh, lots of times in your lifetime is actually becoming less and it's more about how do I how do I get this home that you know 
there's lots I really like about it. Um, love it or list it, you know, is 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 appealing to that. And and your home made perfect, you know, the proper show that we make is also tapping into that. And I think that is the zeitgeist, isn't it? Is is actually I could spend all this money on stamp duty and um, you know uh, removal costs and everything. Actually, do you know what? I could just kind of refigure what I've got here. You know, and you know what, we really do like the local school or we do really like be able to go for bike rides or whatever we've got. Actually, do you know what, maybe moving is not what the answer is here. And I think when you take in the whole country and not just London, I think that is a national conversation. I think it's going to be very interesting to see how we come out of lockdown, because if you didn't like your house going into lockdown... <laughs> Uh, but at the same time, I think there will be some people who've adjusted their relationships with their homes, discovered parts of their community that they didn't know, discovered walks or attractions on their doorstep, which they weren't previously interested in. One of the things I think will be very interesting is, as, as Debs knows, I used to get desperately frustrated with people who would say, oh, well, we want a house. Um, we want to have a spare bedroom in case we have a baby and we're planning on this and that, but it must be close to the bars and the restaurants and this and that. And I used to say, well, to be honest, at that point in your life, you're really not going to be going to the bars and the restaurants that much. And now with COVID, a lot of the properties where the location was the attraction in terms of the commute and the bars and the restaurants and all of that, I wonder how those people coped because when all of those things were shut down, how is your home, your actual home? Is it about the actual home that you're in or is it about the attractions in the area? I think that's really key. I think during the, the, during the COVID, with, uh, people are rethinking all of those things. And one of the interesting, I give, give you an example. We get, I mean, we get about 400 applications a month. We only do nine builds. We were gonna do six builds this year and we're now because of the, what's happened, we're only likely to do four, but, um, we get, we get several hundred uh, uh, applications a month to come and do stuff. And one of them was actually, there was a community of 30,000 people um, in North L London on a Facebook group who were saying that this, this lady's in a terrible situation. Her husband uh, has become seriously ill. Her two children are unwell um, suddenly. And uh, she, needs, uh, she needs, and they were partway through a renovation on their house. Um, and they need to, uh, and she's in a terrible situation financially up against it. Um, and can you organise some people to come in and do finish off the rest of the house? Or as I said, well, does she own their own house? Yes. And where is it in North London? And they told me, and I looked it up, and I was like, well, the house is worth just over two million pounds. Mm -hmm. her, chil her children are in need. Of, she's in need of finance. So I said, you, why don't you just sell the house and move somewhere else with a smaller house? And she went, well, I can't at the moment because I won't get the best price for it. So she's so we're now so obsessed with our the, what our how, home is worth that it doesn't even occur to you to actually use the money that's in your house because your children and your husband are unwell and need your, well, you, you look, look for the community to come and support you in your ownership of your over two million pound house because you won't get the best price. And I think that last 20 years, we have seen too much of our homes as something that you can invest in. And, you know, if I stick an extension on, yeah, but you know, you probably won't get the value out of it when you come to sell it. Yeah, but I could do with a really nice kitchen. I, I, I currently live in a rented property because I decided to try this area two years ago and my friend had a cottage and said, have a look at this cottage. So I thought, that's perfect. I, I spent 10 grand on the garden because I want a garden in the back garden and I enjoy the garden. And when I move from here, I won't have the garden and the next person will get it. But my, my quality of life is about the place I am at the moment and, and how my, I interact with my children in the space that I've got. And I think we've got, I think people are, because of the lockdown, thinking more in that way. And I started to consider rather than what is my house worth if I sell it and buy it and, as a commodity, much more what is my home like to live in. And I think you're right that any changes will come rather than buying and selling, because I, don't think, I think it's going to be an unstable market for the next couple of years anyway. Um, I think people are going to stay home. We're going to try and improve the space in which they live to the optimum for a living, the living conditions for them for living, not for profit. Yeah. Nick, I think you're absolutely right. I think that whole hangover from the property boom of the sort of 90s 
Um, we're just sort of starting to get out of bed the next day from it and not look at property as being something that we can do a quick buck with. We're looking at property now as how does it improve my life? Kirsty, I was doing exactly the same thing. I live in East London. I suddenly discovered like two bike rides just around the corner from me. And it's like I'm in the countryside all of a sudden. I mean, I'm very, I love where I live anyway, but um, that just made me love it even more. But having to work from home now, I've had to carve out my own little workspace. And just having your laptop on your desk in your kitchen isn't, it, it doesn't work because you can't unplug from work. So I think people are going to start looking at their houses again now. They're going to start looking at, well, how can I create a space where I can work? How can I create a space that's dedicated for the kids? How can I make the garden feel like it's more of the home? How can I do things with what I've got with small additions and cleverly reworking the space so that I enjoy being here more? Because, of course, they're seeing their house now in a different light. They're seeing it at two o'clock in the afternoon and three o'clock in the afternoon. Where does the sun come from? What are the noises like? What are the shops like? All these things that people weren't experiencing before, which will make them start thinking about it again. And this is where clever design comes in. This is where being able to sit down with a client with a bit of tracing and a pen and go through some ideas. And I do this with my friends. I always sort of joke that if I get a dinner invite round to my friends, so like three times within uh, you know six months, clearly I'm either going to be up in the loft having a look at a loft extension, or I'm going to be after dessert. The tracing will come out, and I'll be drawing an extension at the back, and that's fine as long as it's a good dessert. I'm happy, but people are really starting to think about this a lot more. Really I think that um, oh, okay. part of it is is this thing that we're realizing that we might have reached peak stuff yes. um, and uh we, we we've just got too much i mean i i keep on saying um to my other half god as soon as lockdown is properly ended there's going to be the mother of all car boot sales um because Where do you live again there's going to be the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's just it's it's gonna be there's so much stuff that people have realized that they've had and a lot of us have been buying properties, bigger properties, you know, putting additions on after we've had Damien around to dinner and, um, and, and filling them with stuff that we don't actually need and doesn't provide us with that much happiness. And actually, I, I, mean, I, I shared this with the group a little bit earlier, but just for the people tuning in, two years ago, I sat in a, in a room in my Georgian house in London and I put my watch down and I thought, where is it? And I went into two rooms that I hadn't been in for a year. Uh, and, and literally, I had got a bigger and bigger house because that's what you do as you do better in life. And I suddenly thought, what the hell am I doing? So I got rid of the big house and I now live in a tiny little cottage in the countryside uh, with a little, little, little pocket garden and surrounded by fields. And actually, the, that's what it turned out I needed in my life. I didn't need a big house. And actually... That change has made me 70% happier in life. It's not always upwards, you know, it's that you don't have to, you don't always have to get bigger to be happier. In fact, you were, uh, Damien, you were showing us around yours and the lovely lot, we can just see your, your rafters there. Oh, hang on a minute, I'll give you a look. You see it? Yeah, this, this was my home little DIY bit. And those are just the builder's joists. And that's just, you know, that was space that was already there. I came to see this house. I said, does it come with rights to the loft? Because in London, it often doesn't. I stuck my head up in the loft. There was a rat there looking at me with something in its mouth. I was like, oh, but stripped it all out, took the ceilings up. And you can make so much out of the space that you've already got. And it just floods with light and it, it, it uplifts you. It makes it a happy place to be. Deborah, it feels like... Um... The, the 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 lockdown situation is affecting this type of show more than anything else you know property and gardening shows and from what what everyone said what nick damien and kirsty are saying that it's changing the way people are thinking about their homes so is that going to affect the way you you um commission shows and the way you run shows on channel four i mean i've got a i've got an idea in um in development at the moment that is direct reflection of um it's it's hard to talk about it without being able to talk about it but it's a property <laughs> show that directly reflects um what people are longing for at the moment and i think that you know when we're talking about why, why property shows are, are ever successful it's because they can be reactive 
you know, the, all the discussion we're having now, you know, to Kirsty's point about chucking things out, Oxfam have already been in the news today saying, please, you know, hold back. We can't take all of your stuff. We, you know, and it's, it, and you know that there'll be teams across the UK coming up with ideas to be reactive. And, you know, we, um, I remember developing Phil Spencer's secret agent as a direct answer to the last recession. You know, best of both worlds for Kirsty was, I think an article, one statistic in the Telegraph, forgive me. Um, and, and, and I think that's where you're at your strongest, where you can read what, like we can see it today, that everyone's got a story about how they're feeling just now. And you know that those stories are happening across the UK. And the most helpful you can be to Kitty's point, you know, when you're being helpful is to directly reflect that. And I think during lockdown, a lot of our best programmes have sort of said, we know how you're feeling at home right now. Let us be useful or let us transport you somewhere else. And I've, you know, commissioned a couple of things during lockdown and you really get that connection with your audience that you didn't have before. And they write in in different ways and they engage with it in different ways. It's a lovely opportunity. It's difficult because I suspect we're all in the same boat. I am desperate to get back out there absolutely desperate there's the market is changing people's needs are changing you know anyone that we had cast for this summer of you know we were about to start love or list it and location location you know do they want now what they wanted before have, you know have they lost their job have they changed their job you know so much has changed and as someone who spent 20 years traveling up and down the country every week going into people's homes I've been able to really imagine during lockdown what those homes look like but now I am really 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 you know champ champing at the bit to get back out there in this new market and and get on with our job which is helping people. Kirsty it'll be very interesting when you when you get out there just to follow that up with them and say well what did you want before lockdown yeah. what are your priorities and what are your priorities now and that's yeah. a Really nice, it's a very personal narrative for everyone to be able to be a bit of a fly on the wall on them. You know, everyone going on the same journey. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's going to be, it's, it's going to be very interesting, and it's going to be a challenge for television because often we don't refer to politics. Um, so I've made shows during the Scottish referendum in Glasgow, making no reference to the referendum. We all made shows making no reference to Brexit. You know, we've all, we all have this, as you know, we, we all have this, there's a sort of weird, strange thing within television when you just sort of don't reference the outside world. Mm -hmm. You know, you barely mention if it's raining. But um, now with COVID, we are, it is the most significant thing which has happened to the entire world since since the second world war really and we are going to have to make reference to it i just don't know how you know it's 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 going to be a very different way of doing things and obviously aside from the fact we're going to have to film in a different way and, and operate in a different way and we're all i'm sure you are all having meetings at the moment i know i am trying to work out how we're going to do that kitty are you having meetings <laughs> lots of meetings <laughs> Yeah, lots and lots of meetings. I mean, we were lucky that we did the chunk of the next series of your homemade perfect um, before lockdown. We got all the VR and the designs done. Um, so we were we were really lucky with that. Um, and we obviously we don't follow the builds in the same way that traditional programs do. Um, you know, and I would say that actually your homemade perfect, you know, I think what it did in terms of helping um, what the audience are looking for, you know, it was that whole um, trying to imagine your house, you know, the VR and the graphics, they really help people right now in their lives think, well, how would it look? And it's that whole kind of try before you buy. Actually, I don't have to spend any money here. So I think... You know, I'd like to think that that's what's been behind the success of that format is, is it, it talks to the next generation and with the graphics, but also it gives people an idea who can't visualise what their home could look like. Um, and I think that's what's really helped. 
I'm going to ask you all, I'm going to come to some um, viewer, viewer questions in a minute, but how do you all feel about the future of, of, of property shows? Do you think COVID is going to change show, the, these shows forever, um, Kirsty, or do you think okay. you know, your next Boyd. series will have to include it? Sorry. Boyd, I don't know if you can hear the four booming boys who are having lunch next door. Now they are... <laughs> making some form of smoothie. I'm just going to quickly shut the kitchen door so that... Fine. Can no, we can't. I can't hear it. We can't hear no, it. No, it's fine. No, no, no. <laughs> but um, let me <laughs> ask that to you. I'll, I'll, I'll answer in the meantime. It doesn't yeah. matter when you... When, it doesn't matter what the circumstances. Uh, during the Second World War, when people were worried about bombs raining down, and they were still decorating their kitchens and parlours and trying to make the place look nice. You know, post-war when there was no money around, my mum used to go out and used to polish her front step. She had a red step, which they used to polish with a thing called Admiral Red, which I, I can picture as a child seeing my mother do that because it was important that the front step was shiny. Why? I don't know. But that's, you know, so it doesn't matter the circumstances. It, you know, if we all end up living um, in, in sort of mud igloos, then somebody will work out how to plant flowers on it and make it a lot more attractive. So... It's, I, I think actually it's going to be a really good time for property shows in terms of how to make your space more uh, more livable, how to make the most of space, uh, as we were just talking about architecturally. Um, I think how to uh, how to enjoy the space that you're in, and I think less. I think probably less moving. I think there will be. Sadly, I think there will be. We're in danger of repossessions of houses, so there will be movement in the market, and I don't think it's necessarily going to be in an upward direction. So I think probably um, we're going to be back in that sort of 19, 1970s, 80s time again, 1980s time probably. Um, but there's time to actually make, so there is going to be a, a time to actually make the most of the house you're in. And I think it's going to be a good time for property programs as long as, as, as long as you acknowledge it. And very often people will say in production meetings, well, you know, this is a difficult situation, isn't it? How, how do we get around this difficult situation? And I always say, just tell the truth. Yeah, because the yeah. easiest way to actually explain a difficult situation is to tell the truth. When when we do a when we do a DIY West and then the person who we're doing the build for is not be able to be released from hospital, come and see the grand finale. Now, how are we going to get around it? We're going to get around it by telling the people at home that the person isn't well enough to come out and see the house, and we'll send the camera back when they do. But you know, it's not the end of the world because we're not the most important thing happening here. And actually, if you're honest with the audience and you're honest about the situation, it's the really easy and straightforward way to do it. So going forward, as long as we're honest about the situation we're in and we don't pretend you know, that, there, there's, that we're doing things in a way that, aren't, that doesn't reflect the general population, I think the, 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 property, you know, the um, makeover shows will continue in great strength. I couldn't agree more, Nick. We, when we were making the craft show, which we filmed here at home last month, or God, it all goes in a blur, anyway, at some point in lockdown, you know, we, we had to make reference to what we were doing because there were all sorts of things which we, which we previously were able to do on the craft show that we couldn't do. And I got so much response from people saying, oh, I loved it when you did that. I loved it when you did that. I always used to love, um, uh, oh, do you remember that brilliant, brilliant chef uh, who did those shows? Floyd, what was he called? Um, Keith Floyd. Keith, Keith Floyd. Floyd. Thanks, Damien. And, and he always made reference to his team and the crew and the mistakes and yeah. everything. And I always, always loved that. And I think hopefully post-COVID, uh, we will see more of that because it will force us into the honesty that Nick is talking about. Yeah. I was uh, COVID joke with Nick the other day. He sort of the sound man appeared and I, I actually said, that's the sound man. Um, uh, looks like he should be wearing a mask. Uh, it isn't. It's just his face. That was my first COVID joke. Of the <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What do you think about the future of, of 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 these shows and of your shows? I think the um, I think the future of the shows is is certain. It's guaranteed. We have a love affair with property that will continue. I think what is interesting that's come out of this through the whole COVID crisis is that. There needs to be another way of designing these houses. And it's for one of two reasons, I think. It's either to give more privacy within the house for all the reasons we've talked about, whether you're working at home or whether you need a separate area for the kids or you just want to reimagine your space. 
But probably more importantly now, which has really been highlighted through this, is to make our homes and our communities less isolating. And how can we design in a manner now where a lot of us are all thinking, oh, what about such and such down the road? I haven't seen them. You'll walk past somebody's house and see them looking out of the window if they're elderly, and you'll be saying, I wonder if anyone's actually checking up on them and be, making sure they're okay. So is there a way with the property for shows of the future where you can bring communities together to build a larger scale project, almost like a sort of mega scale of what you do, Nick, with an SOS, but building a community square, building a collection of houses where all of these things are designed out. Because if you look at schools, schools have been reimagined to design out bullying with no corridors and no dead spaces. If you can do that with communities, with a collection of houses, and maybe it's that the property shows just get bigger because they start to incorporate more members of the community. So four different homeowners looking for somewhere, can't find what they want. They all come together and build something together themselves that satisfies all their needs. That's and it's a really good idea. Really exciting. When, when um, we built the, the Veteran Street up in Manchester, that worked so well that yeah. now over in the Hull, We've just been given a 30 acre site to build uh, an eight million pound veterans village which includes training center workspaces walkways um raised um uh, sort of uh, pod buildings and more um, um it, it's basically employment training the whole thing we get the chance to actually develop um almost a village from the start yeah uh, which is a really exciting opportunity and to throw away all of it actually it's on an area that's flooded in the past and so we're actually involved, including water management and using the water uh, that runs through the site as, um, as to create power as well. And to be able to start from a blank canvas and start again, I think is, is such an exciting opportunity because it's so long since we've done anything really yeah. truly original in terms of how we build our villages and interactive spaces. You're absolutely right that somebody, we need to start replotting how we do that. And, and, and thinking about those about that interaction we got it sort of terribly wrong with high-rise flats where yeah. architecture thought it would work because people would be more social in actual fact they it's they definitely right. missed their green spaces and and we didn't put enough in the terms of schools and shops and playgrounds and various other things to make those spaces work but that just because we messed it up once before doesn't mean we shouldn't be trying better to do to do it better this time around when people are in the, in the mood for it. Well, we sort of started out well, and you look at all the little community areas that people love, like Bourneville and all the sort of Quaker developments. Then you went yeah. high rise, then you've come back down and something's been lost in amongst it. I know this is sort of a, a larger subject, but I think there are areas from that that you can take onto smaller scale developments. Maybe it's two houses and people living next door to each other. One's an elderly couple, the other one had, don't have space for kids. Can you join those together so that the elderly people aren't lonely they're looking after the kids and you've created a little pocket community i think there's an exciting future for all these sorts of proposals there's also interesting i was saying if you don't if we just briefly went on on that subject uh, we were talking recently about the fact that small homes are starter homes when builders build starter homes two bedroom homes and little homes on estates um that they and they make them for the for the start home and the first time buyer but, but what they miss out on is the people who want to downsize the elderly community, who want to downsize and go from a four bedroom down to a two bedroom. And they can't buy those because they have narrow doors and they have tiny little light switches and difficult handles. How difficult would it be to actually build those houses with wide, elegant switches that are easy to switch as the well light switches, put disability sized doors in when you build the place. And then, you've, it, then it's both a home for those coming up through the market and for those going down through the market. Economically, it makes sense for the builder, but they just don't do it because they have set views about what they're building and for who. And I think architecture has a huge part to play and architects in actually being more creative so that we end up with mixed communities with elderly and first time buyers living in two bedroom properties because it would make sense, wouldn't it? It would, it would make perfect sense. <laughs> I think, me... interestingly, that's what years ago Prince Charles was trying to achieve with Panbury and he was much mocked by the architect, I know you see, <laughs> by the architectural world. But if you if you take out your views on the architecture, actually the mixed use, the elderly, the shops, the 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 areas which everyone could walk to, the sort of that was the thinking behind yeah. the use of it. And I think that is incredibly important. Um, 
that that you know to next point about it's idiotic to create any space which is solely for the use of a young family of course it should there should be a space which can be used by a young family and a couple who are, are downsizing let me come to some uh, of our viewer questions then and i think actually this first one i'm going to put to deborah to start with which is when will you introduce a program aimed at people who are on a lower budget um covering people who don't own their own houses and maybe also won't break their bank balances so we've had one in production for the last couple of years and as i'm sure most people on this panel will know there are certain property shows that that do take years because if you're going to build or do substantial renovation you don't run it to a production schedule you run it to the building schedule and um, so yeah we've got a great house giveaway which uh, is it perhaps working title but it's it's a really clever show from a regional company in wales where it's about using flipping almost to get you your proper deposit um so that'll be out potentially 2021 and yeah we continue to look at stuff like that i mean a, a lot of our shows are about achievable aspiration you know sort of um uh, you know at the normal end of things, I would say. And, you know, Kirsty, I've just been watching some of the reversions we've been doing for location, location throughout the years, first time buyers, you know, tough markets, downsizing, you know. So yeah, we've got, we've got some new stuff coming out, but I feel like over the years, you know, we have reflected the challenges that, that people face. I think that's, that's true in self, a self-owned market, but to answer your person's question, though, there, doesn't, there isn't really anything for people living in rented accommodation and or social, social housing. I don't think there has been anything really, no. And well, it should done, be. Yeah, we've done topical pieces around it. You know, there's always been, you know, one-pound houses um, and, and stuff like that. Tend you, you, that was a great series. One-pound yeah. houses, a very good series, yeah. Exactly, and that had a real community sense to it yeah. as well, to, to Damien's point. Um, I think that probably people see the breadth of what we're offering and the audience numbers do go to the likes and, of Phil and Kirsty and, and, and they do cover different, you know, diverse kinds of searches. Um, but yeah, like, I, think, I think renting is, it's sort of, it's been a hard one for a lot of, you know, for most I would of love, renting. I'd love to crack the renting show. Yeah, people have tried for like 20 years that's the thing it's not like people but have not tried. The rules and regulations as well isn't it that, that, that makes it sort of difficult for all it's, of us as program makers yeah it's yeah. really, really to, difficult which is why you end up with the formats that are about helping people get their first step on the ladder because accessing the other end of it does sort of take you into current affairs territory because what of the rules and Damien. Damien have you got a way through then <laughs> yeah I was about to say, I think if, if you're going to crack the rental issue, which is the main one facing a lot of the younger generation, it's, it's to my mind, it's not so much about trying to change the, the apartment that they're in with a with limited budget, because inevitably they'll always have to reverse it, which is the, the pitfall all renters find themselves in, is that the only thing they can do is put up a shelf that won't mark the wall or a poster with blue tack. But... If you can put the renter and the landlord in the same room together and strike a deal between them where the landlord gets an investment in his property, but they're able to put their stamp on it, especially yeah. because they're going to be living there for three, five years while they save up the deposit. So everybody gets something out of it that they like, as long as it's all pre-agreed from the start. Yeah. And then the landlord knows they're going to look uh, after it. Sorry. Very much. That is a format right there. Well, yeah. I mean, that's uh, yeah. Yeah. landlord. Get so, the landlord and the and, and the and the renter in the, in the room together and see if you can come to an agreement that the person is going to spend some money on it, which he will get back when he moves on because the yeah. landlord has exactly. a more rental. Yep. I think that's what happens in Europe, actually. I think. Yeah. You know, you know, yeah. It's, it, it, that's what. It's the, it's the relationship. It shows thing. translate in different ways when the format sells. Is you know it works. A lot of people in Europe rent for their entire life and and that's just the norm and so because they're there for 20 years they're allowed to change and put a new kitchen in you know well, and the norm of... here until margaret thatcher that, everybody rented here until margaret thatcher came along i'm really looking forward to this new format you're all going to work on together about um renting um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe we could do maybe you could do a format that did something with the three over three hundred thousand empty homes that are around the country yeah. when we yeah. 
when we've got people that, you know, we've got homeless families and there's 300,000 um, empty properties around the country. That's a disgrace. That's actually what we did, again, with the veterans houses in Manchester. We got Manchester Council to give us a semi-derelict, one side of a semi-derelict street so that we could actually re renovate those empty houses and then donate them onto a housing trust to look after the veterans. But I think there should be more of that kind of thing, actually taking advantage of uh, the empty homes because we shouldn't we shouldn't have homeless families and 300,000 empty homes in the country. It's a tricky one though because both Phil and George did a piece on this a few years ago and to Katie's point we got it's so hard you get tied up in so much legislation and council politics and, and all the rest of it so you know I think look the, Property is problematic and that is why it keeps coming back year after year after year because everyone needs help with it. But there are definitely parts of the property market that are quite political and quite bureaucratic. And, and it's, it is also, we have to admit, difficult sometimes to bring an audience to it. Because, for example, at the moment, you know, there's so much going on. And, and so you have to balance that out, you know, escapism with purpose. Um, I've got this very specific question, which I'm going to put to you, Kirsty, which is on programmes that present several choices to house seekers, and we see them choose one and agree a deal with a vendor. How many actually see this through to com contract completion? Ah, uh, well, that is very interesting. Sorry, I keep on sinking into the sofa slowly, slowly, slowly. Um, it's very interesting, Boyd. We rather pride ourselves on having a very high conversion rate. Now, as you probably know, one in three offers made nationally not any in telly does not result in a completion so uh, the, the the i don't want to use bad language but the system we have in the uk for buying houses is rotten it's hopeless it's it, it, it's not fit for purpose governments again and again have ignored opportunities to make it easier it costs a huge amount of money um but we work very closely with our couples, our house hunters. You know, once Phil and I have made that offer in the pub, which we are making and it is completely real and it's not faked in any way, we then really hold their hands. Sometimes it will, it will fall through. You can have a bad survey. You can have a mortgage valuation that goes wrong. They can change their mind. But we do have quite a high strike rate. Um, it's really important for people in my position never to be critical of other shows. Um, but there are shows in which they are buying not necessarily as their first home or they are buying perhaps abroad or something like that. And those shows do have a, a, a lower conversion rate of offers made to actually sales going through. But our rate is pretty good. I don't, I, I can't, give the exact data, but it's, sure. it's pretty good. That's interesting. And finally, we, have, we are running out of time, so I'm gonna ask you all this last final question, which is quite a lighthearted one, a good place to end. How is everyone rearranging their houses to look good on Zoom? Well, Nick, have you rearranged anything? Oh, go on, Kirsty, yeah. Well, I know, I mean, as, as you all know, because we had a pre-meeting this morning, I'd set up my whole office and it was all done and it was all perfect and I was thrilled to bits with it. And the Wi-Fi didn't work in my office, so I had to run into my sitting room, perch the computer on top of the sofa, which I've been slowly sinking into every five minutes throughout this hour. I haven't been showing people around my home. <laughs> it's absolute chaos. <laughs> Children and everything, I've just, this is it. It looks like you've got some nice framed uh, things behind you on the wall. Oh, there. I was saying what I've got is bikes. So this is, okay. there's a lot of bikes in here. My husband cycles and uh, there's a tandem and everything. So it's, yeah. Okay. Deborah, you've got a great plant at least and looks uh, and the sofa, but you haven't got anything behind you. Is that a deliberate move? Um, well, my actual work laptop just faces, I've had to build uh, an office with a, a, a rising desk. Um, and everyone kept comment, commenting on my um, drinks trolley, which was in the back of shop, to the point where I figured I'd better change my setup for this. <laughs> it felt like it was a mark on my character. So if I'm honest, because I'm a property director at heart, I got up 
early and set up this shot. And I would have liked to have put a picture about here, um, but I figured it was going over the top just for one phone call. Fair enough. Um, That's I, 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 basically, I just placed, placed it on the on what is my dining table or the table that I eat on in this room and uh, have books in the background to make me vaguely look well read. But actually, what's more interesting is the stand that I've got my phone on, uh, which if I show you by dropping, there you go. If I take one one line out, it's um, ah. it's a, a decent bottle of decent whiskey, and if and if I take you down even further, you'll see the next level. Oh, hang on, there you go. The next level is beer. <laughs> so, it's perfect so, combination. So brilliant. The that my the, I was just the other way is not nearly as controlled as uh, looking back this way. And I'm throwing the phone all over the place. I'm not Damien really wins the prize I'm, then. I was, just yeah, looking over, I was just looking over my shoulder because I normally do them in my kitchen where, where, where the light's better. But it's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a bomb site over there at the moment. I'm bleaching some tea towels. It's got all the crap from the day all over the table. So uh, I've just come over here because all that side of the house is looking like a bomb's gone off. You're bleaching some tea towels. Wow, that's um... yeah. That's my life. That's me, rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> on that, on that fantastically uh, domestic ending. Uh, thank you all so much for. What I think it's been a fascinating conversation. Um, Deborah, Damien, Kitty, Kirsty, and Nick. Um, it's been brilliant. Thanks to everyone who sent their questions. Sorry, I didn't have time to read many. And thanks to the Royal Television Society for arranging this whole thing. Thank you very much. That's been great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, guys. Well done, boy. Fun. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.